our last session tonight, the God of vision. We serve a God who has good plans and vision for each one of us. And as we come to the last session on 2020 vision, what I want you to get and what I want you to go home is convinced that God's got vision with your name on it. And it's good. Because it was God's idea to create you. And He didn't make anybody else like you. You're unique. God's got vision for you. In 2003, Brother Val Yoder came to me and he says, Rick, I got a vision. And he shared with me his vision of taking training young people in missions to a whole nother level. He shared with me his vision for IGO. He didn't even know what it would be called at that time. He said, would you and your family move with me and my family to Thailand to start this work? And as he shared with me his vision, which came out of a burden, and I took it back to my wife and we prayed about it, we, we got excited about this. The time Val got the vision until it actually came to pass, or we moved to Thailand, there were years. There were difficult times in those years. But what's interesting, or to me what was exciting is being in Thailand, you know, the vision was we're going to train young people in missions on the foreign field rather than train them at home to go to the foreign field. Let's go there and train them. Not only were young people trained, and I watched hundreds of people go through our program and not one of them say I shouldn't have done it. And I saw God work in their lives. But even greater than that are stories like this. There was a laundry lady who had a laundromat just down the street from, from Igo. And I don't know if you say lucky for her, you know, God's hand was on her being there. But her laundromat, when you've got a laundromat there, and all of a sudden you bring in 20 to 30 youth and you say, you know, and it's hot all the time and we have no air conditioner so you've got to wash your clothes a lot, a laundromat's going to be very happy for you. And that was the case. So here's this Buddhist woman who lives just up the street from us. She doesn't know Jesus. We didn't move there for her, at least we didn't think so. But within five years of Igo being there and of young person after young person going up there and taking their laundry there and interacting and talking with her and staff interacting with her, that lady got saved and she believes in Jesus Christ tonight. It's like, wow, God takes a vision that he gives one man and then the man gets a team together so God gives this vision to a team and then he brings him there and he does not only what the vision is, but he does more than that. That's the God we serve. I love stories about people like Mei Wan and how she got saved. I could tell you other stories of people that got saved or pastors who were encouraged through the work of I go there. And that was above and beyond the vision that Val had and then other ones of us picked up. And you know, that's just like God. To give vision to a normal, ordinary, humble person. And then they share it. And after a while, the vision is shared and a team goes forth and God does more than what we expect. God had a vision. He had a need. He had a need in Genesis chapter 37. He has a need. There's a country that's dark. It's a heathen country. There's no light there. They don't know Jehovah God. And God wants to make his name known in Egypt. And how's he going to do that? Oh, he needs to send some light there. God's not saying, okay, Gabriel, go down to Egypt and clue Pharaoh in that I am God and it's not you and not the sun. I created the sun. No, he doesn't do that. He, chose, chose, he chooses to use ordinary people. So who's God going to send to Egypt? Joseph. Genesis 37. Joseph, 17 years old. God gives him two dreams. Kind of shook him and woke him up a little bit and gave him a picture of what could and should be. First dream, Joseph's in a field, and all of a sudden his sheaf rises up, and 11 sheaves around his all bow down to his. And Joseph, there's so much good about his life, you almost get the picture that he's a perfect man. I think one of the things, but he's not. We know he's not. He's flesh and blood. He struggled. He failed, just like all of us. But I think one of his mistakes was he went and told his brothers right away, hey, guys, guess what dream I had? 
Eleven sheaves and my sheaf. And all the other eleven sheaves bowed down. And they, you know, these guys knew math. Eleven of us, one of you. We bowed down. Uh-uh-uh, that's not happening. And to make it worse is Joseph is his dad's favorite. That never helps. Then God gives him another dream. This time he brings in the mom and dad too. The dream is this. And Joseph tells his family this one also. Not, I'm not sure that was wise, but he did. I had a dream. The sun the moon and 11 stars all bow down to me. Now, again, they not only do a little math here, they do a little thinking. Sun, dad, moon, mom, 11 stars, us. And you, Joseph, you have got to be kidding. And it almost seems like his brother set out to make sure that dream, that vision was not going to come to pass. But when God's got plans, he's going to see him through. I wonder if God would have talked to Joseph a little more in depth about his vision. I wonder what Joseph's response would have been. What if in Genesis 37, if God would have said, Joseph, I have a vision. I need somebody to go to Egypt to make my name known. And I don't want them just making my name known to just their neighbors, not just to the low class, I want them to make it known to everybody, in fact, even to Pharaoh. And in this vision, I want somebody that's going to go down there that's going to be ruler over all of Egypt except for Pharaoh. But the guy's going to be, have so much respect that Pharaoh's basically going to say, you're the man, go for it, you're in charge of everything. Joseph, are you into this vision? Well, what would you say if you heard that? Okay, God, you want me a Hebrew boy, to go down to Egypt, you and me in charge of that country? Yes, Joseph, that's the plan. Wow. You never put that in a dream like that. would have been all the galaxies bowing down to me if you did that. Yeah, that's the plan, Joseph. The plan is you're going to go to Egypt, and you're going to rule over them, and my name's going to be made known there. Are you in? I think Joseph would have said, I'm in. I'm in. I'll go, God. How am I going to get there? Well, the way you're going to get there is some Midianites are going to take you down to Egypt. And uh, I've heard different Asian pastors get mixed up with Midianites and Mennonites. You know, they're not the same. At least we hope they don't confuse us. Uh, he's going to Mennonite his way to Egypt, right? Uh, no. The Midianites are going to take you down to Egypt. Joseph's like, God, I don't even know Midianites. Like, oh, how am I supposed to get a ride from the Midianites if, if I don't? And what are they going to do? Introduce me to Pharaoh? No, no, no. It's your brothers. They've got the connections. They're going to get you with the Midianites, and they'll take you down. My brothers, God, they don't like me. We don't get along. Exactly. That's how it's going to work out. You see, Joseph, your brothers are going to grab you one day. They're going to throw you in a pit. They're going to rip off that special coat of yours that your father gave. And then while you're in that pit crying for mercy, they're going to be up there on top saying, okay, now what do we do? Let's get rid of this dreamer. We're going to make sure that we're not bowing down to him. Let's get rid of him. What do we do? We could kill him. And we can take the coat back, put blood on it, kill a goat, take a dad, and, you know, we're covered. No problem. So we could kill him. And then they're going to see Midianites come along, and they're going to say, no, we can sell him. And so they're going to debate this, kill him, sell him, kill him. And then they're going to end up saying, oh, we're, we're going to sell you. And they're going to sell you as a slave to the Midianites, and that's how you're getting to Egypt. Joseph would be like, time out, God. Time out. I thought the plan was, I go to Egypt to rule, to make your name known. Now you've got my brothers beating up on me. I, I, why do you have that a part of your plan? They do that already. You don't even have to plan that. You're sending me as a slave. God... Pharaoh is not going to go to a band of Midianites and say, hey, you got any slaves? I need a new ruler in Egypt. Uh, it's not going to happen, God. That's okay, Joseph. That's okay. Because, Joseph, you're not done being a slave with the Midianites. They're going to take you down to Egypt, and then they're going to sell you to Potiphar. Oh, you mean I'm going to be a slave in Egypt? Yeah. You're going to be a slave to Potiphar. He's going to buy you. And you're going to work in his house. You know, it's the dream job of every 17-year-old to clean house all the time and not get paid. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what Joseph thought. Uh-uh. Yeah, that's what you're going to do. And Joseph, just cluing you in here, you're going to clean house. You're going to do it so well that Potiphar's going to make you in charge of the house. 
And that's kind of cool because then you get to say, you shake this rug, you do that rug, you mop the floors, and you know, you, you're know you going to be in charge. And you could have rule over everything except his wife. And while that seems good, it's going to get bad because Potiphar's wife is going to look at you and you're such a respectful man, you're such a man of character that she's going to start to lust after you. And she's going to try to get you to commit adultery with her. But Joseph, I know you. You're a man of character. You're going to say no. And by the way, Joseph, I'll be with you. When you read the story of Joseph over and over, it says, but God was with him. Joseph, I'm going to be with you in Egypt in Potiphar's house. Oh, that's good, God. You're going to be with me. So when she tempts me, you're going to be with me. You're going to be the strength to say no. So then it's going to go well with me, right? Actually, it's not. She's going to grab hold of you one day and say, lie with me. But Joseph, you're going to be faithful. You're going to say no, and you're going to run. You're going to get out of there because you're not going to give in to that temptation because you're going to be faithful to my principles. You're going to be faithful to me. That's why I'm sending you, Joseph. So I'm going to run, and then what? She's going to lie about you to her husband. She's going to tell her husband that you tried to rape her. God, I thought you were with me. You're going to tell Potiphar that it's not true. It was her idea. Actually, Joseph, no, I'm not. Potiphar's going to believe his wife. He's going to be very angry with you. And even though he's trusted you and made you in charge of all his house, he's going to send you to prison in Egypt. No, God, I thought you said you would be with me. I thought you reward faithfulness. I'm going to be in prison in Egypt. Time out. The big picture is I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to rule in Egypt. I'm going to make your name known in Egypt. And I'm even going to rule over my my family there. God, you've got me first a slave to the Midianites. Now you've got me a slave to Potiphar. Now you've got me in prison in Egypt for doing right? Come on, God. I thought this vision was I'm going to be second in command. Why are you sending me for prison for doing right? Joseph, you need to understand it's part of the process, it's part of the preparation. You're going to go to prison and you're going to be faithful in prison. How are you faithful in prison? Like, you stand still? Like, how are you faithful in prison, God? Well, Joseph, you're going to be in prison. You're going to be faithful. You're going to be so faithful and have such character that the keeper of the jail is going to make you in charge of all the prison. Oh, thanks, God. My dream, to rule in prison in Egypt. Yeah, that's what you're going to do. You're going to rule, and you're going to have the character that you're not going to be in there having a pity party for yourself because my big picture vision isn't going the way you thought. No, no, you're not going to have a pity party for yourself. You're going to care about others. And one day you're going to see the butler and the baker who served Potiphar or who served Pharaoh and who are now in prison. You're going to see them and they're looking sad and you're going to say, hey guys, what's wrong? Because you reach out, you care about people because you're not having a pity party. And when you ask them what's wrong, they'll say, well, we both had a dream and it's a bad dream. We can't figure it out. I'm going to help you, Joseph, interpret their dream. Oh, thanks, God. That's, <laughs> I guess that's good. Yes, because you interpret their dream. You're going to tell the butler that he's going to get out in three days. You're going to tell the baker he's going to be hung in three days. That'll probably be a tough one for you to tell him. And when the butler gets out, he gets to go back to Pharaoh. Now you've got a connection with Pharaoh. Oh, okay, God, now I see it. So you're letting me out of prison through this butler. And when he goes out, he's going to go to Pharaoh and say, hey, there's somebody in the prison who's so faithful, so caring, a man of such character that he doesn't deserve to be in there. He should be out ruling over Egypt. And then Pharaoh's going to send for me. No, Joseph. No. You need two more years in prison after the butler's out. more years God I've lost track of this story do the math for me I'm 17 now where am I at 
Well, when you interpret the dream, you're 28. So when you get out, and then you become ruler over Egypt, you're 30. How many of you would say yes to a vision of 13 years of beat on by your brothers, sold as a slave, alone away from family in Egypt? You're faithful to God, and it just gets worse and worse. 13 years. The prime of your life is wasted. You still in? God didn't do it that way with Joseph, and there's a reason. I think Joseph, like you and me, would have said, no, God, let's do something else. <laughs> Just let my dad take me down to Egypt. That'd be a lot easier. No, that wouldn't have worked. Honestly, there was no other way to get Joseph to be second in the command than the way that God ordained, right? We read the story from Genesis 39, 37, 38, 39, all the way through 50, and we're like, hang in there, Joseph. It'll get better. God's with you. Yes, God's with you. We see it. Joseph didn't know the end. He had the big picture vision, I'm going to rule. He had that picture, but he didn't know the process. God didn't tell him every step of the way, and God knows better than to tell us every step of the way because I think it overwhelmed us. I think it would have overwhelmed Joseph. But Joseph knew God is a good God who has good plans for his people. And his plans are to bring you to an expected end, he says in Jeremiah. Plans to prosper you. Joseph, it's going to get good. You're going to come out and everything that you visioned of you ruling over your family and over Egypt, it will come to pass. But there's a lot of preparation in the midst. Stay with it, Joseph. Stay with it. Joseph stayed with it. He understood some concepts here that we've got to understand here. Let me give them to you. To be involved in God's vision, in God's work, four words that Joseph lived out in fulfilling the vision. The God of vision, to be involved in God's vision and work, the first thing that you've got to do, and we just see this over and over in Joseph, is be faithful. Be faithful. It doesn't matter what God's vision is. It doesn't matter where you're at on the timetable. It doesn't matter if you're 17 and dad says, go check on your brothers. It doesn't matter if you're 25 and you're locked up in prison. It doesn't matter if you're 20 and you're cleaning house in Potiphar's house. Be faithful. And that's same, that same for you. It doesn't matter where you're at in the timetable of God's vision for you. Be faithful. Be faithful. You never go wrong when you're faithful. No matter what happened to Joseph, he was faithful. You could say he was faithful wherever he was. The second thing that Joseph did for us, be flexible. Be flexible. Again, you don't know the plan's to get you to that vision. You don't know what's between here and there, just like Joseph didn't. And when Joseph has this turn where he's sold to the Midianites, not what he expected, sold as a slave in Egypt, I thought I was going to rule. Lied about and thrown in prison, God, I thought you'd reward me for faithfulness. Joseph was flexible in spite of plans not going the way he wanted to. I've met many people who have trashed the vision God gave them because they wouldn't flex their plans. If that's where Joseph would have been, he would have never fulfilled God's vision. Be faithful, be flexible. Number three, follow, follow. We need to be people who follow the good shepherd. We're not in charge. We're going to follow you. We're going to do what you say, God. It's not my life. And you know what that comes to? That comes to the fourth word, forsake, forsake. We've got to forsake our life. How are we going to be faithful? How are we going to be flexible? How are we going to follow if we're keeping our life for ourselves? Jesus said, if any man's going to come after me, let him lay down his life and follow me. Young people, if Joseph would have said, I'm hanging on to my life, I like the vision of ruling over my family, 
but I'm not into this slave stuff. I'm out of here. I think he could have escaped out of Potiphar's house. When he's in charge in Potiphar's house, I think he could have gotten out of there. I think he could have got away. I think he could have made it back home. But he didn't because he trusted a good God who had good plans for him. Joseph was faithful. He was flexible. He followed what God had for him. And he forsook his life. Young people tonight, Joseph isn't anybody special. He was a 17-year-old kid who was picked on by his big brothers. He was faithful to God. And God used him. You're an ordinary person. But that's the only type God uses. There's not a one of you that God doesn't have plans for. God's a God of vision. God's not going to send his angels to get the work done in 2020. He's choosing to use ordinary people like us. He's got vision, and I think he gives us a picture of that big vision because it gives us purpose, it gives us direction, it gives us clarity. And we need the direction and the clarity and the purpose because often in the midst from where we get the vision to where it comes to pass, it gets difficult. It was difficult for David. It was difficult for Joseph. Who am I to think it's going to be any different for me? 2020 vision. 2020 vision is vision where you see clearly. It's the best vision. God's got 2020 vision for your life. Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him? I'm confident there are many of you here tonight that do trust God. You know He's got a call in your life. But right now, you're not serving in the palace. You're on that train going to Egypt. It's not like you expected. Or maybe you're working in Potiphar's house and it's not what you wanted to do. It's not where you wanted to serve. Or maybe you're in prison because you chose to do right. And God lets you suffer for choosing right. And you're tempted tonight to get bitter at God. You're tempted to abandon the process. Young people tonight, there's not one of you that God doesn't have good plans for you. But every one of you, listen to me. God's plans, God's vision involve timing and involve preparation. And the preparation is to grow you deeper like we've been singing. And it's growing you deeper in character. Joseph wasn't ready to lead in Egypt at 17. He wasn't ready at 20. He needed 13 years. David wasn't ready to be king of Israel at 10 or 15. He needed those 15 to 20 years. And just speaking to the youth, there's a few old, old guys in here tonight, but speaking to the youth, you are primarily in a stage of preparation in your life. Embrace it. We're going to have invitation tonight. The call tonight is this. We all know we need vision. We know how to get it. We ask God for a burden. We know how to get a burden. We can do that. I think we can do that on our own. I don't think we need to come front and cry for that. Tonight, the invitation is for those of you who have the vision, 
but it's gotten tough in the journey. And you're thinking of giving up. You're thinking of compromising principles. You're thinking of turning from God. You're thinking of turning from church because it's hard. David didn't do it. Joseph didn't do it. And you can do it too. You can be faithful like David and Joseph. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Oh God, may you encourage, may you encourage us tonight in your faithfulness. You are a good God. You've got good plans. But you care about us so much that you don't want to ruin us in success. You don't want to just send us right to the pinnacle of vision. You care about the process. You care about the preparation. And Father, for every young person that's here tonight, maybe for every adult that's here tonight, they're in a tough place in the process. God, may you speak to their heart tonight. May you give them hope tonight, God. May they see you as a good God who's got good plans and you're faithful in the journey. You're faithful in prison. You're faithful on that slave trade to Egypt. God, you're with us every step of the way. And Father, for those that are struggling with that tonight, may you speak to their hearts tonight. May they leave tonight convinced that you're a God of vision. You've got good vision for them and they're going to stay with the process to the end. Oh, God, speak courage to us tonight. I pray in the name of Jesus, amen.